sometimes I look at my life, at my mistakes, at my faults, and I see regret. My life full of choices has led me far from where I wanted to be. My life full of chances is left with defeat. Sometimes it just seems so dark in here. I see what used to be a clean white piece of paper, stained with my sins and failures. I see the joy of living, oppressed by my past directions, decisions, and defeats. I see this life that was designed to be clean and white, destroyed by the permanent marks I've made on my life. Yet when I read the Bible, I remember that even though I have sinned, even though I have made permanent marks on my life, there is hope. There is the cross. There is the eternal life that is promised to me by the death of my Savior. I remember that Jesus bled for my sins, for my marks, and continually wipes them away. I remember that even with my past, I can have a new start. With Him, His glory, His strength wipes away my faults and weaknesses. His ultimate sacrifice has led to my ultimate salvation. On that cross, Jesus took my place, my scarred, marked paper my sinful, messed up life and gave me a new one. this is true for you, for me, that our lives in Christ, in the cross, are white paper with all the stains gone, all the faults, all the failures. That's the good news in Christ, that we are saved, forgiven, made clean, washed clean, not because of anything we have done or earned, but because of what He has done, His cross, for us. And that, that that cleansing, that justifying, that redeeming is mine, not through any efforts of my own, but through faith in Him alone, by grace alone free gift. He's paid my entrance fee for heaven. If my debts are a debt, He's paid off the mortgage. Grace alone, through faith alone, not by my works, but trusting in Him. Salvation is not a, a ladder to climb to heaven, but a gift from God, which He comes down to give to us and gives us anew today through His Word. Grace alone, faith alone, our memory verse for today, for this week. Well known, maybe you already have it memorized. If not, you should. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace, gift, you have been saved. Through faith, believing, trusting. And this is not from yourselves. You didn't do this. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that None of us have any ground to boast before Him. Grace alone, faith alone, white paper. Today is Reformation Sunday. And today we mark, we celebrate in the Lutheran Church. We celebrate it because it's a celebration, not of the church being fractured almost 500 years ago, but it's a celebration of the gospel. 
that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone, and that we are called by God to proclaim that message which has so blessed our lives. Grace alone, faith alone, reformation. But the word reformation, it's called Reformation Sunday, not just Gospel Sunday. The word reformation, that word, what does that mean? What does reform, reformation mean? It means change, doesn't it? To reform is to, to change. And a reformation, if you will, is taking a look at what's in your life or what's around you and saying, well, this needs to change. I need to reform. Now, what's that have to do with the gospel? What does reformation have to do with grace alone, faith alone? Well, everything. Because what we celebrate on reformation what Reformation in the church is about is changing, reforming anything that gets in the way of the gospel. And this message, grace alone through faith alone. Built on the third alone, Scripture alone. We focused on that last Reformation. This year we're focusing on the gospel. Grace alone, faith alone. That this is who we are. This is what we proclaim. And everything else may need to be reformed or changed again and again and again for the sake of the gospel. So in the, the Lutheran church, in the Reformation church, Reformation isn't supposed to be just a, a day that, of the past that we celebrate and commemorate like a birthday. But it's a celebration should be, of our core value, reforming for the sake of the gospel, of looking at what's going on, what's in our life, what's in the world, what do we need to change, what do we need to reform for the sake of the gospel. It's who we are, who we're supposed to be. But reformation as a uh, a church thing, church reformation, well, it didn't start in the 16th century, and it's not limited to those who go by the name of Lutheran. But many reformations understood this way, change for the sake of the gospel. There have been many reformations, many reformers. And this will be an ongoing activity today. But it all started, or the big reformation that we want to talk about today is the one that took place in Jerusalem and is written about in Acts 15. Um, Acts 15, where we are in our study of Acts. And we've been going through Acts, seeing some amazing things over the past number of weeks. But we've come to today, in Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, this coming together of the people of God in Jerusalem. This is a real watershed moment for the church. This is a really critical, pivotal fulcrum for the church, because what's going on here is the church is having to decide, do we want to be a mission church? Do we really want to take seriously Jesus' call that we be witnesses, His witnesses of the resurrection to the nations? Or are we just going to be a sect within Judaism? Who are we going to be? And that's what they're struggling with in this, this Acts chapter 15. Now, what happened here, what's, what's going on has to do with the Gentiles and all these Gentiles that have been coming into the church. Gentile, once again, that is a non-Jewish person. So this started with, with uh, Cornelius. Remember Cornelius? A few weeks ago we talked about him. And the Holy Spirit orchestrated that whole event, if you remember, with visions for Cornelius and Peter and bringing it all about, the miracle of the Spirit being given. That was one family. And then from there we saw an Antioch. Some of the people in Antioch, we don't even know who they are, start sharing the gospel with Greeks. That means Gentiles. And then it became more intentional, as we heard a couple weeks ago, Paul and Barnabas by the church in Antioch are released, that they may go out wherever the Spirit leads them. And the Spirit led them to Cyprus and then up into Cilicia. And while they are there, they had made the choice intentionally to take the gospel to the Gentiles. So what began as a trickle with Cornelius was quickly becoming a flood. 
And now there are Gentiles pouring into the church, those who believe in Christ, but haven't been circumcised, haven't been keeping the Old Testament law. So that's the question here is, what are we going to do with all these Gentiles? Do they, here's the question, do they have to become good Jews before we'll consider them full believers? Now, that may seem like a pretty weird or silly question for us today from our perspective, but it was a perfectly natural, normal question for them, given where they were. You've got to keep in mind, at this point, the believers did not consider themselves a separate church. They saw themselves as true Jews. They were the true Israelites, the true Jews, because they had embraced the true Messiah. That was prophesied by the Torah and the Old Testament prophets. Now, the fact was, most of the Jews hadn't caught on yet. But that didn't change the thing that they were the true Jews, and hopefully everybody else will catch up. And ever since the time of Moses, to be a true, believing, faithful Jew, it meant what? You're circumcised. You kept the dietary laws. You observed the Sabbath. You came to the temple, you kept the festivals, and and countless other traditions as we heard about in our gospel today. And now we have all these God-fearing Gentiles coming into the church claiming they believe in Christ, being given the Spirit and baptized without being circumcised or having to keep all of these traditions. What are we going to do with this? Do we really want these Gentiles? And if so, what does it mean? Will they, the Gentiles need to start keeping all of these laws? Are we going to have like a, or are we going to have like a two-tiered church with the faithful Jews up here and the Gentiles as second class because they're not circumcised and they don't keep all the same rules? Or if we decide that they don't have to do all of the, the traditions of the Old Testament, if they don't have to, then what does that mean for the good faithful Jewish believers? Do they have to keep them anymore? Yeah, this was huge, huge. And Jesus, Jesus hadn't talked a whole lot about that. We see hints of it like in our gospel today. But Jesus had promised that the Spirit would lead them into the truth and the Spirit would teach them. And that's what we've been seeing over the past number of weeks and the things that have been happening in Acts. It is the Holy Spirit teaching His church, teaching His disciples about this truth that God intends the gospel for all with no obstacles. It's the Spirit who orchestrated the whole Cornelius incident. It's the Spirit who, who uh, gave uh, Paul, through Paul, blinded Elemas. It's the Spirit who worked those miracles in Paul and Barnabas' ministry. Been teaching them. And this is what we see going on in this council of Jerusalem, if you will, all the, the leaders gathered there What they're really doing here is saying, well, what has the Spirit been teaching us? We've got this hard thing we've got to figure out about our future and who we are and who are these new believers. What's the Spirit been teaching us? And so we hear from Peter, we hear from Paul and Barnabas, we hear from James, but they're really all talking the same thing. Well, this is what I see the Spirit doing. So I just want to read part of what Peter says because, read that again, because it really encapsulates this. I'm looking at verse 7 in um, verse seven in Acts, well, verse 6, I guess. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. He's talking about the Cornelius incident. And notice how he worded that. Some time ago, God made a decision. You remember that story? Peter wasn't actually willing at first. Had some trouble with the whole vision thing in the in get up and eat. But God made a choice. God did this. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith, faith alone. You hear what Peter's saying? God showed that by pouring out the Spirit on those those Gentiles. Now then, why do you try to put God to the test by putting on the necks of of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, and here's the key point, 
We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. What the Spirit had been teaching Peter, ultimately, is this. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Grace alone, and their hearts purified by faith alone. This is what he was teaching. And then going on to verse 12, Paul and Barnabas talk about their journey, but look how it's worded. The miracles and signs and wonders the Holy Spirit did among the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit was teaching them. And then James got up to talk, and what does James do? He talks about what the Holy Spirit had given Amos the prophet to write. So the Holy Spirit had been leading the church. And what did he lead the church to see? that they were to welcome the Gentiles, that they, were to, they would be welcomed into the church as full brothers and sisters, not second class, saved by grace through faith and not required to keep the Old Testament law. That's what the Spirit was leading them to. But also, look at what this means. Look at what this means. What did, for, for them to come to this conclusion, think about what it meant that they were leaving behind. What they were going to say, well, this really isn't needed anymore. Oh, circumcision, the di- dietary laws, the Passover, Yom Kippur, keeping the Sabbath all these other traditions. Not the Scriptures, not the Torah and the prophets and the writings. Nope, those are bedrock. Not the gospel that we are saved by grace through faith. No, those are unchanging. But essentially, everything else that was part of how they lived their faith, they said here in Acts 15, you know, we don't really need it. We don't really need it. We don't need it. The gospel is that important. The cross demands that we take this step because we are saved by grace alone through faith alone. The mission demands we take this step because God has shown us He wants the Gentiles in with no obstacles. Well, sure, individual Jews were, who believed could keep some of those traditions on their own if they'd like to. You can still keep the dietary laws and observe this or that. But now it's moved from the realm of right and wrong to personal preference and style. This was huge. Huge. I don't know if we can really get our minds around the enormity of what happened here and what they did. Nearly everything about how they lived their faith, they set aside, left it behind for the sake of the gospel. That is reformation. That is change. And yes, that letter indicated a few things that they wanted the Gentiles to keep in mind. These were things that they they wanted at this time to help the church be one. It mentions sexual immorality. Of course, that's a universal, and there's always concerns about were the Gentiles as moral as the good Jews. And so that's in there. But the other ones all have to do about food and eating. And this was so the Jews and Gentiles could eat together. They knew, those who wrote this up knew that not all of the Jewish believers would be as open to this change and as quick to accept it as they were. And so this is kind of an accommodation that Jew, Gentiles are saying, essentially. We want to be able to come together, eat together, and it's going to be a huge step just to get the Jews and Gentiles at the same table together. So when you come to eat together, don't bring food that's going to, make us, it's going to be hard for us to accept. That's why they said it would be do well to avoid these things. It's all so that the church might be one. And so they left this council of Jerusalem, a truly gospel, missional, reformation church. For the sake of the cross, for the sake of the mission, put everything on the table 
and we're willing to change it all for the sake of the gospel. Reformation. Now, this was not the only, this one and the one in the 16th century certainly weren't the only reformations, as I said. This is to be an ongoing how the church lives. And throughout the centuries, there have been numerous reformations and reformers. Sometimes a church has to reform or a part of it has to reform because the Spirit is leading the church and leading Christians across a cultural boundary. And then so the church has to say, well, gosh, we want to take the unchanging scriptures and the unchanging gospel into this new place where everything is different. What do we have to leave behind so we can do it? What do we have to change? What do we have to reform? Missionaries doing that all the time. It's something that we are called to do today. This is what was going on in Acts 15. Reform, changing for the sake of the gospel and where the Spirit's leading us. Sometimes reformation is needed because the church has forgotten the gospel or has gotten, the gospel has gotten obscured, and that's what was going on in the 16th century. The gospel had become obscured and hidden under layers of tradition and bad practice and distracted by corruption and greed and all kinds of stuff. And so this movement began, this reformation, about reclaiming the gospel and, re and putting it back in the center, grace alone through faith alone. And unfortunately, not all the church embraced reformation. And unfortunately, those that didn't want reformation kicked out those that did. And that's a sad, sad thing that we're still having to deal with in the church. But those that did embrace reformation did so for the sake of grace alone through faith alone and then put everything on the table again, like in Acts 15. What do we have to change? What do we have to reform so that the gospel can go forth? The scriptures, no, those stay the same. In fact, we better put the scriptures in a language we can read. The gospel does not change. Grace alone through faith alone. Let's get it out there front and center. And they changed so many things in the church. Anything that gave the impression that we're saved by our works had to go. And so many other things, they changed the way they did it so that the gospel would be more front and center. Once again, a time of incredible change that I think it would be hard for us to really get our minds around. They changed everything, they changed everything about worship. Brought in to, to worship congregational hymn singing using what at the time were contemporary tunes so people could sing them. Changed everything about how they did communion. Changed how the church was structured. Changed how the churches got along with each other. Changed it all. Not for the sake of change, but for the sake of the gospel. So they could go forward as a reforming gospel church. That's what they did. Now what does this mean for us today? Church of the Reformation, Lutheran Church. Well, it means we are called to the same activity, the same ongoing activity of reformation, reforming and change for the sake of the gospel. This ongoing activity of looking at what is going on in the world, looking at the mission field, looking at how we live the mission, how we do the mission, and saying, where are we putting up obstacles to God's gospel by what we're doing or not doing? Where are we giving the wrong impression? Where are we failing in communicating the saving gospel? Where are we obscuring it? What do we need to change? Now, am I leading up to some big announcement about a big change here? No. No, but you know we, we are constantly, constantly looking at what we're doing. And it's hard. It's hard. A lot easier just to leave everything the way it is. Lutheran church, Reformation church. Reformation is not just a birthday. Not just a day in the past, but a core value of who we are, what we are about reforming for the sake 
of the gospel. Grace alone, through faith alone, Scripture alone. And sometimes it's hard to change. I think that's why the Spirit in Acts did all these grand miracles, because He knows that we have a hard time with change. And sometimes we disagree with each other. We're trying to figure out the best way to change. We are one, one Scripture, one in our confession of grace alone, faith alone, in Christ. And you know, this isn't even really only about church. Us as individuals as well. Is God calling you to reformation, calling me to reformation? Are there things in my life that i got to put on the table and say, God, what do I need to change so I better live and communicate the gospel by what I say and by what I do? Am I showing Christ by the way I conduct my life? Or do I need a reformation? Reform. Grace alone. Faith alone. Not just a slogan. Not just a family heirloom. It is our life in Christ. It is our core value, if you will, 